Amen. I like that. That was good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glad you're here this morning. I'm glad to be here myself. Praise the Lord. Uh, take your Bible. Go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Amen. And uh, yes, I am definitely an opponent of political correctness. Amen. I'm an opponent of political. Amen. But I'm glad to be saved. Luke chapter 16 this morning, and we'll begin reading in verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Could have been an American. This is Don Nesbitt, YouTube. Named Lazarus, which was laid at his gates, full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, you got a comparison here. Bible teaches often by comparison, and the Lord's laying out a comparison between two men, and the bottom line is they're as different as night and day. One of them, by the world standards, and the world standards haven't changed that much, uh, the world standards would indicate that uh, man number one, the rich man, has arrived. He's successful financially, he eats well, dresses well, and uh, the other guy is uh, about the opposite of that. Again, rude, crude, and socially unacceptable. He doesn't even have his health. And these guys don't appear to have a lot in common, but they, they have some, something very important in common. They have the same thing in common that everybody in here has and everybody everywhere has. Verse 22, and it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. And was buried. No mention of angels, no mention of anything good about him anymore. As, as much as these two guys were different, the Bible said, and as it is appointed unto man once to die. And then it doesn't stop there. See, and it says, and after this, the judgment. And they were different, then they had this thing called death in common, and then they become quite different again. Uh, notice in verse 23, and in hell, the context is still the rich man. His sin wasn't being rich. It says, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. He recognized Abraham. He may very well have been a religious fella. Have mercy on me. He never said it while he was alive. But it's the first thing he said after he died. Uh, life doesn't end at death. It begins. And he says... Have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, the reason I refer to that passage is because this is the very passage that was preached to me early in November 1990 while incarcerated in the Montgomery County Jail, Dayton, Ohio, 15 years with motorcycle gangs, a multitude of bad habits, amen, and ended up in a little church service, not because I was interested in God, but just because I wanted to get out of myself. The first message that I heard as an adult was this passage right here, and the preacher preached on hell. And what he said was essentially this, I don't know what you're in jail for. He talked to the three of us that came down to the service, he says, I don't know what you're in jail for, but I'm going to tell you this, regardless of what you're looking at with your case, your future, if you die in your sin, if you die without uh, getting the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away your sin, uh, you got bigger problems than prison. I thought to myself, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot, chaplain. Thanks for making me feel better. Amen. 
Uh, he essentially, I was looking at 37 years in prison at the time, and what the guy says, that's nothing. You're going to burn forever. I just wanted you to know, I didn't appreciate that much. I didn't like it. But I'm going to tell you something else, and I learned to appreciate it later. Uh, that book says in John chapter 8, And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Boy, and I tell you what, now that I have been a Christian for 20 years and I've learned some things, I thank God that he sent a man to me uh, with the guts to tell me the truth. Even though it wasn't a very popular message, that guy told me the truth because he cared about my soul. I don't know what that says. Well, really I do, but... All across America this morning, uh, there's, uh, there's church houses busting at the seam where nobody's going to tell anybody the truth, but they're going to leave feeling better. I'll tell you what, I felt better the morning I bowed my heart to Jesus Christ. People said, Spurgeon's just playing the game. He's afraid to go to prison. I wasn't afraid of going to prison. I got more friends there than some of you got out here. <laughs> But that preacher preached on hell, and I'm going to tell you what, and I'm not ashamed to admit to anybody that I was afraid of going to hell. And I'm not going. And I'm going to preach on it a little bit this morning, maybe remind you of some things, and perhaps you're in here today and you've never had your sins scripturally forgiven. We appreciate you're in church this morning. But perhaps this morning uh, you're not saved. Boy, I tell you what, you're in the right place. You're, you're here at the right time. And we've got the right, the book, the right prayers, and the right attitude, and the right people to open God's book and show you how simple it is. How simple is it? 20-year drunkard, drug addict, criminal gang member was able to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ and get his sins washed away. Now, if he did that for me, what excuse could you possibly have? Amen. Let's pray again. Father, I do love you, and I pray that you take what I'm about to say, and may it be a blessing to you and accomplish your purpose. And Lord God, I pray and plead the blood of Jesus Christ as I talk about hell this morning with an earnest desire to try to help prevent somebody from going there. And God, I know that's why this church stands here, uh, to pro proclaim the glorious gospel as a warning, and I Pray that today that warning would be heeded as necessary. And uh, again, I, I need your help, Lord, and I pray for it in the name of my Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, the Bible says hell is a real place. Amen. It's a place where people go and don't come back. Say, well, that's not the way I was taught. Well, I'm sorry, but if the way you are taught is contrary to the Bible, you are taught wrong. And I don't say that to be ugly. I, the remedy for that is opening the Bible and showing you the right thing. And again, we can do that here. Uh, hell wasn't uh, uh, supposed to be a place for people at all. Matthew 25 and 41 says, Then shall he, that's him, then shall he say uh, also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Amen. It wasn't supposed to be for the souls of men, but sin entered. But I got good news for you this morning. It doesn't have to be the eternal destination of anybody in here because the Bible says the Lord is not, is not slack concerning his promise, uh, but is, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. I got in the habit of circling the word long-suffering when it comes to being an attribute of God toward us. I'm glad he is. But his long suffering toward us, uh, to us, were not willing that any should perish, any, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Now, uh, if you've done any personal work at all, you may have used an approach like this. Uh, do you know? where you're going to go when you die. You generally don't have to spend a lot of time talking people into realizing they're going to die. 
Amen. Everybody knows that. People got a lot of ideas and opinions on, from there on. But we all understand that nobody's walking around two, three hundred years old. We've got an appointment. Amen. And uh, so you might say it like that. Do you know where you're going to go? And, uh, and not think. You'll let people say, well, I, I think, uh, I hope. Uh, and that's not the answer. Because the question was, do you know? where you're going to go when you die. And you'll find that there's people that claim to be Christians. There's people that are members of churches, been in church all their life, and they don't know. I'm glad if there's, I don't know a lot. Like Paul said, uh, uh, I beseech, uh, I, I count not myself to have apprehended, uh, but this one thing I do, I'm glad that I know where my soul is going to spend eternity. It doesn't have much to do with me at all. It has everything to do with well, Lord Jesus Christ, and I say to you this morning, you can know where yours is going to spend eternity because it's going to spend it somewhere. Amen. Now, I don't know if this ties in with the preacher's introduction to me or not, but I've come up with my own line, which I've used successfully a few times. Uh, rather than say, do you know where you're going to go when you die? I've just asked people on occasion, uh, hey, man. What are you counting on to keep you out of hell? That kind of gets a reaction because the Bible says hell's real. And uh, I'll tell you what, and if it is, and it is, uh, you ought not, anybody that says they don't mind going to hell is, needs a, an examination or they don't have an understanding of what it is. Uh, it's not a good place, Amen. It's a place of everlasting fire and torment. And uh, if you're on your way there today, uh, I hope you get your eternal destination turned around this morning. And if, uh, if you're not sure about this thing, I'm going to put it to you like that and title this message, What Are You Counting On to Keep You Out of Hell? And the reason I say that, because in the course of just... Uh, being a Christian, let alone a preacher, just in my 20 years of walking with God, uh, I've heard a lot of people uh, say that they're counting on a lot of different things, and maybe that you'd fall into one of these categories today, and boy, if you're in the wrong category, God's giving you no chance to get that straightened out. Amen. Amen. Hey, here's what a lot of people are counting on. Take your Bible and go to uh, Genesis chapter 11. Here's what a lot of people are counting on. Let me read verse uh, 4, I think will be sufficient. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 4. The Bible says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Here you got a bunch of guys. They got together. Their purpose is clear. They want to go to heaven. What's wrong with that? That's noble enough. Amen. Here's the problem. You don't find God mentioned in a thing. You know, that to me is the epitome of religion today. It's man with the noble uh, uh, endeavor of trying to, wanting to get to heaven, but wanting to do it his way. And I'm going to tell you something. Jesus said... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, and no man's going to get there his way. It's got to be God's way. And there's folks all over America today that are counting on religion, amen, to keep them out of hell. And, beloved, this morning, religion's not going to keep anybody out of hell. Religion, I define it as this, as a system of things you must do so that you might make it. That sounds like being on parole. Amen. As long as you dot all your I's and cross all your T's when you get to the end of the thing, maybe, maybe you'll make it. I'm glad I don't have that today. I'm glad if there's one thing I know. That book says in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast and if you could earn your way to heaven, if you could work your way to heaven, why? Why would the 
lovely Lord Jesus Christ have had to go to the cross of Calvary. The account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ would be a morbid story if it wasn't absolutely necessary. My question uh, this morning, uh, if you're not saved, what are you counting on uh, to keep you out of hell? I hope it's not religion. Religion won't do it. What you need is Jesus Christ plus nothing and minus nothing. Amen. Religion's not going to do it, but that's what a lot of people are counting on. Amen. Some are counting on this. Some are counting on a combination of these things. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Amen. I'm going to tell you what's going to keep some people uh, out of heaven. What's going to keep some people on the road to hell is because what they're counting on uh, is their own righteousness. Now listen, I can preach all day long. There's none righteous. Uh, there's none that doeth good. All it's in and come short of the glory of God. I can do that and still there's people that are going to sit in a pew and in their mind, they're not going to identify with that because compared to so-and-so, they're not so bad. And you know, the truth of the matter is, as an evangelist, you know, the truth is, traveling around the country, we meet a lot of good people. Uh, listen, you need to get your nose off the, out of the television and all that stuff that tries to convince you that the majority of Americans are perverts and crooks and adulterers. No, the majority of Americans are just pretty decent, hardworking people doing the best they can, but they still need Jesus Christ to get into heaven. We, from the truck stops, Amen to the, uh, all over the country, where we go. You know, I'll tell you something. I love my country. I'm glad God called me uh, to America. Amen. I'm a patriot. That, that doesn't mean I like uh, um, very much of what's going on on the national level, but I'll tell you what, I love Americans. But, but beloved, you may be the most outstanding, upstanding member of your community, and that's to your credit. Well, that's not going to keep you out of hell. You're not going to be judged when it comes to, and as it is appointed on a man once to die, but after this, the judgment, you're not going to be compared to anybody else. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The glory of God has a name, and it's Jesus Christ. And, I, you know, I hope I'm not popping your bubble, but compared to him, you're going to come short. And you don't want to be trusting in your own righteousness. The Bible says in Isaiah 64, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. So I, you know, I hope you take this right, but I'm going to tell you what. On your best day, your righteousness will get you a front row seat at the lake of fire. Amen. I'm just telling you the truth and love. Uh, conversely, and the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21... For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. No, you can't. You must not trust your own righteousness this morning, but, uh, beloved, you can trust his. His righteousness will get you into heaven. The question this morning is, whose are you counting on to keep you out of hell? All right? A lot of folks do have trusted in those one of those two things, and I'll just tell you, looking at crowd this size or safe bet, that we got some of that in here. And that's good news. And that's not a condemnation. Uh, it is my privilege to tell you the truth from the Bible today. Amen. Uh, there's other things. Uh, 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 Isaiah chapter 1. Go ahead and go there. Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, some folks are trusting in religion, and uh, some folks are trusting in their own righteousness, and I'll give you credit. You may be a fine person. I'll give that to you. But uh, that's not going to get you in. And it's not going to keep you out of hell. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, familiar passage. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as 
scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I marvel that the God of everything, the creator of everything, the king of glory, would bother to try to talk us into reasoning with him. Amen. Doesn't it seem like it should be the other way around? Doesn't it seem like we should be teaching God? But he's saying, come now, let us reason together. You got a sin problem that you cannot take care of, and I can take care of it. Won't you let me? But you know what the problem is? Especially in America, we've got people, rather than trusting God, they're trusting in their own reasoning. And tell you what, the more educated people get, the more they tend to do that. Amen. We reason with ourselves. We reason with each other. I witnessed to a guy, hey man, what are you counting on to keep you out of hell? He didn't have a bad spirit, uh, a confrontation at all. He just said, looked at me and said, oh, I don't believe in hell. I thought, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> man, he is sincere as could be. But the problem is the reality of hell is not dependent upon whether or not you choose to believe it. Where you spend eternity is dependent upon whether or not you choose to believe it. Because, beloved, this morning that book says hell's real. Amen. Uh, rock music, Hollywood, they promote a party in hell. Oh, yeah, songs about it. Movies about it. And they've turned the devil into a cartoon character so that God doesn't have to be real either. Let me tell you something. Devil's real and so is God. Amen. Amen. And hell's real. And my question for you is, what are you counting on to keep you out? There's no party there. Listen, I buried 41 of my own guys out of 15 years in motorcycle gangs, and the last thing I said to every one of them with a pistol in the air was, I'll see you in hell, brother. I was more doctrinally correct than pastors across the country this morning. Why? Because that's where they went, and that's where I was going. But see, we do the convenient thing. We just choose to forget about the Torment, the flame, and uh, that's a lie out of the devil's hell. There's no party there, but I know people that have reasoned themselves into thinking that, that one of the major gangs had a saying like this, uh, better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. <laughs> the only problem is nobody's ruling in hell. Looks like old crowds weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth with full knowledge according to this passage in Luke, uh, full knowledge that they didn't have to be there, that the Lord did everything he could to keep them out, that the Lord sent some loudmouth preacher to try to tell them the truth before it was too late. Looked like that's what's going on. Doesn't look like anybody ruling. Hey, nobody's partying. You got that going on in your head. You better get rid of it. That's the wrong reasoning. I was a young Christian, and I, uh, and I, uh, I witnessed to a fellow that I was working with, and uh, he's a nice enough guy, too. And he says, uh, he says uh, uh, well, I, I believe uh, either one of two things. That's what he said. I was trying to tell him what the Bible said. I said, man, what are you counting on to keep you out of hell? He said, well, uh, I, I don't believe in hell. I believe in, I believe in either this. You know what? There's a Bible verse in James that says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know, long before I knew that was a Bible verse, I knew it was true. Amen. It was true on the street. Uh, people that can't make up their minds, amen, are, un are unstable in other areas. The uh, Bible says all their ways. And this guy said, well, I believe either one or two things. Uh, either, either I believe that, that when you die, you die, and that's it. And you're buried, and it's over, and that's done. And then he says, or, he is a deep thinker. Or, I believe that everybody just goes to a better place. Now, those philosophies are very different, except for one key 
element. There's no judgment attached to either one of them. In other words, you just live any way you want, and you'll either go nowhere or you'll go to a better place. I said to the guy, so in other words, what you're telling me is that according to that philosophy, uh, uh, you're going to just uh, do the best you can and live any way you want and have a good old time. And, and according to you, I'm going to try to live according to that Bible. I'm going to try to love my wife. I'm going to try to uh, uh, be a, a good father. I'm going to try to abstain from all appearance of evil. I'm going to try to be a blessing uh, to my church. And according to your philosophy, if that's right, I will have have lived a very boring life and missed out on a lot of fun and we're all just going to end up in a better place. Amen. He said, yeah, yeah, I see it like that. I said, would you consider for a moment it, that you might be wrong and that if the Bible is true, I'm going to heaven, but you're going to bust hell wide open. He had reasoned himself into some things that very unrealistic. I had a guy in jail one time. Uh, he had reasoned it like this. He said, uh, I asked him, what are you counting on to keep you out of hell? He said, this is hell. Now he's in jail. I've been there. Every report from his lawyer is bad. I've been there. Every report from home is bad. I've been there. And I understood what he was talking about. But I'm gonna, I couldn't prove it to him like I'm going to prove it to you right now. But he said, this is hell. And he was talking about the circumstances that he was involved in in his life. He couldn't imagine it getting any worse. I said, no, this isn't hell. And this is why right there. You see that? I don't know if you can see it. There's, a drop of, there's not one drop of water. And where we were, I was able to say, you know that river right outside? This isn't hell. Not even close. You know what the good news is? If you're saved in here this morning, I mean really, scripturally, this is as close as you're ever going to get. Outside of maybe six more feet. Amen. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you're not saved and you die before you get it, this is as close to heaven as you're ever going to get. Oh, well, don't let your own reasoning talk you out of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I had someone tell me one time, well, uh, hell can't be real. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, God wouldn't put people in hell. And I said, well, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I said, it looks to me like God has gone to a great extent to keep you out of hell. If you go, it won't be God's fault. It'll be your fault. If you reject Jesus Christ and his glorious uh, soul-saving gospel, you'll put yourself there. What are you counting on this morning? I can go around this room and get testimonies of people where they were saved, circumstances that God orchestrated to get them to a place where they'd confess Christ. Somebody had enough sense to respond to the preaching of the Word of God. Seems to me like that'd be the best way. Some of you could tell me that you're in places where you're at the bottom or at wit's end or maybe in a medical situation or even in jail like me. And that's what it took. That's what it took to get you to the place where you bowed your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in a room this size, I could get a variety of different professions, testimonies. Again, let me say, the best place, and I'm confident many of you maybe have the testimony that you just responded to the truth and put your faith in Christ. But if, in all honesty, we took a poll of this room and of those of you that aren't saved, if I was to ask, why not? What are you counting on? Would you, within your own spirit, say, well, I'm counting on my religion. Well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm counting on my righteousness. Would you, would you in all honesty, respond with, with, well, this is the way I see it. 
Beloved, if you see it, contrary to that book, with as much graciousness as I can muster, you're wrong. What are you counting on to keep you out of hell? I'll tell you what some people are counting on. They're counting on a little one, two, three, repeat after me, little prayer. I've seen it over and over. I've seen the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ and an invitation to get saved presented like a sales pitch by excellent salesmen. I've seen people respond because they thought, well, in all logic, that's something I need to get taken care of. And I've seen people come forward and pray a little prayer and get up with a spirit and a testimony later to prove it to be true. Well, I've got that done. Now I can get on with what I want to do. Could I submit to you this morning? That if you really get a hold of what Jesus Christ did on the cross to keep you out of hell, it'll change what you want to do. Amen? It'll change. It changed me. Christian life, I heard a preacher say it like this one time, the Christian life is easier and much more fun if you're saved. You hear what I just said? There's people going to church, man, and out of duty and every other reason. And then there's some of us that are just like it. Amen. What's yours? Uh, what's your testimony? That Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And we've got his churches full of people in it. Maybe your case today... Uh, that you believed, I mean, you'll admit that you're a sinner, but all your belief is here. And it needs to be here. So what do you mean, Brother Spurgeon? I mean like this. I have explained it to prisoners like this. If everybody else in the history of mankind was on their way to heaven except you, Jesus Christ would have still taken the beaten. He'd have still allowed them to nail him to a cross for you. That's what the difference between just chalking it down to another historical fact or getting a hold of the fact that God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. If you're in here this morning and your belief's all here and you've never got a hold of it in your heart, you're headed for hell, friend. And it doesn't have to be that way. Somebody said, well, how will I know if my little prayer was real? Well, I just look at it like this. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I know everybody didn't need a shave and a haircut. Everybody didn't get saved out of life. But something changes, and it's not the outward, it's the inward. Amen. And, and so they said, well, don't you believe people can backslide? Well, I know for a fact they can. My problem with, with people that prayed a little prayer never front slid. And I'd be worried if I, I'm not a retreader by any means, but I, I would ask you to examine yourself. Listen, if you prayed some little prayer and nothing ever changed, the affection to your heart, the desires of your heart to learn more about it, to please yourself, nothing ever changed. I'd, I'd be doing a little checkup if I was you. This is serious business. This is hell. This is about what Jesus did to keep you out. Are you going to heaven when you die? When you give an account of what you did? Well, accepting the gift of eternal life at the expense of God's Son, will that be on the list? I hope so. I hope so. Why not? Where's why? Here's, here's the reality of the thing. It says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is real. Jesus preached on hell way more than he did on heaven. Why? Because hell's bad. You know, if you're saved, when you get to heaven, you'll be brought up to speed. He doesn't want you to be brought up to speed about the reality of hell. So he preached on it. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 
And verse 9, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. I love that verse. I got several messages out of that verse. But could I submit to you this morning that the antithesis of that is also true? That I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for those that reject him. Christ went to the cross so that you don't experience that. Christian, you know this, Christ died to keep you out of hell. Jesus Christ didn't go to the cross uh, so that you could go to heaven. Jesus Christ did not go to the cross so that you could have victory. Jesus Christ did not go to the cross so that you could have life and that more abundantly. And Jesus Christ did not go to the cross to put your marriage back together. That's not why he died. Those are just benefits of being a Christian. Well, that book says Christ died for our sins according to Scripture and was buried and rose again the third day according to Scripture. And, and if you're saved in here, you know that. And that's not all you know. You know people that are lost. What are you doing? What are you doing to warn them? I heard this illustration as a young Christian. There's a guy uh, going down the road uh, with his family late at night. Uh, a two-lane road out in the country. I think it was out west. And, uh, and uh, there's a car in the, in, uh, in the distance in front of him. And four-way flashers are on. And as he got closer, he was apprehensive. He slowed down. The man standing in the middle of the road, uh, waving his coat, frantically trying to flag him down. Amen. That, that was, that'd be a scary thing these days. You wouldn't want to slow down or stop. But the guy slowed down and, and, and stopped and, and just cracked his window a little bit. His family's in the car. And the guy is frantic. And he said, the bridge is out. The bridge is out. And he explained to him that just a mile up the road, a, Bridge was out, hundreds of feet, sure death. If he'd have kept going the way he was going. And the guy, he says, you stay here and I'll go get state police. Barricade the road. And the guy drove away and his taillight disappeared in the darkness. And here, can picture yourself. Here you are with your family knowing you are within minutes. Uh, of, of death, your children, and, and somebody flagged you down. You'd be glad about that, wouldn't you? Amen. You'd be rejoicing, wouldn't you? Amen. But here's the thing. In a few minutes, a, another set of headlights appear on the horizon in your rearview mirror, and they're coming, and you've got a decision to make, and you can get out and flag them down. Or you can just praise Jesus that you were spared and let him drive right on by. And beloved, it ought not be so. Question is, what are you counting on to keep you out of hell? And, and some of you, many of you, uh, that, 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 that account settled. But what are you doing to keep others out? Amen. And finally, I'll say this. If you're here and you've never been spiritually saved right now as it stands if an airplane crashed on this building and we were all to die you'd go to hell you'd lift up your eyes in hell and and God gave his only begotten son to say this that don't go I'm not willing that any should perish I made a way for you and from the cross Jesus Christ uh, would say this don't go he said father forgive them for they know not what they do and if you're in here today it is our desire. It is our prayer. It is our heart that you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not join a church. Not get bad. We're not talking about any of that stuff. This thing's about heaven and hell. And Christ died to keep you out of, out of hell. Well, that rich man, if we could talk to him right now, the one in our original text, the one that lifted up his eyes in hell, and the first thing he said was, Father, have mercy on me. He didn't get it. He didn't get a drop of water. He didn't get mercy. And if we could talk to him right now, you know what he'd say? Don't come here. The passage records that, that he had a burden for his brothers. 
And, and if you read on in Luke 16 uh, that he wanted uh, 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 someone sent to his brother's house because they didn't want them to come there. Too bad he didn't have a burden for his family before he died when he could have done something about it. You might be in here today and you're not really concerned about it. You will be one day if you end up in hell. But if we could hear the voice of his companions in that place right now, if we could make it out between the crying and the gnashing of teeth, and we'd hear this, don't come here. Nothing's worth being here. The Bible's true. The preacher's right. Jesus is Lord. Get saved while you can. That's what they'd say. And this church exists. Situated here on the side of the interstate with a Sign out there welcoming people to come. Come to Jesus Christ. This church exists so that you can find out how you don't have to go to hell. And there's a lot of benefits that go with being a church member, but boy, I'll tell you what. The biggest one is the truth. And the truth is if you've never been saved, you're on your way, and you don't have to go. The Bible says in uh, Hebrews 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What possible joy would be worth what he went through? Well, maybe you come into the saving knowledge of Christ this morning. Amen? Despising the shame, but it'd be worth it. He went to the cross for you and I. I got it. I got it the hard way. I was in the horrible pit and in the miry clay, and I'm not the only one in here like that. But boy, I'll tell you what. Would to God, would to God, I'd have just listened. Would to God, I'd have responded. Would to God, I wouldn't have had to make God prove it to me. But even in that case, better late than never. But I'm going to tell you this. There's a lot of people that hear it and just keep going. And you're in danger. And this message is a warning. What are you counting on to keep you out of Hell, you came to church. Praise the Lord, that's a good start. How about making today the day you come to Christ? Father, I love you and I pray that you'd take these words and I pray they'd find a home in the heart of these believers, Lord, as we have responsibility to live in a way to point this world to you. And uh, there's a good spirit that way and tender hearts and there may be some that are caught up with some cares or worldliness and pray you'd help them get back on track but specifically lord someone in here that's not saved does not know beyond a shadow of a doubt they'd go to that place called heaven i pray that you make it real easy for them to understand that the greatest need they have is that right there and i pray that they would allow one of us to open a bible and show them what it says about forgiveness through Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. With their heads bowed and their eyes closed and the instruments are playing and the service is coming to a conclusion now. Truth be known, this is the most important part of the service. The opportunity for each and every one of us to respond. I'm going to ask you this morning Take a moment as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and examine your heart. And would you please answer the question that the preacher posed this morning? What am I counting on to keep me out of hell and to get me to heaven? If you don't have a good answer to that question, if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, this is your opportunity. We've got people in the front here. Can take you off into a side room for a couple minutes, answer any question you might have, have a word of prayer with you, get the matter settled. We wouldn't bother this morning trying to make a Baptist out of you. That wouldn't help. We're not trying to get in your pockets. We wouldn't try to baptize you. That wouldn't do it either. We just want to introduce you to Jesus Christ as personal Savior. A simple prayer of faith. A simple transfer 
of our confidence and our faith from whatever we've had it in into the finished work of Christ. And that's what you need this morning. We're here to help. We encourage you to respond. Just a moment, we're going to sing a song of invitation. As that song is being sung, let me encourage you. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, you feel something tugging on your heart this morning, you feel like, I need to do something about this but I'm not sure what. Let me encourage you to come. Step out into the aisle. Come forward. Let somebody work with you. We've got men up here that can work with the men, ladies with the ladies. But don't let this opportunity pass. Life is so short. It's so busy. We get distracted so easy. Right now, while God's speaking to your heart, Take this opportunity to come and trust Jesus Christ. Father, bless the invitation now. Lord, we pray that precious souls would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, as your people, those that have already been saved, Lord, that we would gain a new vision and a new burden of what's really important in life. So often, Lord, we're caught up in things that are trivial and temporal. Help us to realize each day that those we come in contact with need Christ people do as the song says need the Lord help us Lord to be more soul conscious help us to open our mouths help us to be a witness bless this invitation we pray in Jesus name amen let's stand let's take our hymnals 243 number 243 if you don't know Christ as your personal savior just come on up while we're singing this song just come on up right now don't make any delay As we sing, the cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide, and its grace so free is sufficient for me, and deep is its fountain. As wide as the sea, there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Oh, millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room. I'd like to ask us just to go ahead and bow our heads one more time in prayer. The instruments are playing. Some have already come. And I realize that uh, this can be intimidating. I understand that. Most of us would rather not single ourselves out in any way. And yet at the same time, truth be known, most of us here this morning that know Christ got saved in a service just like this. And we want you to have the same opportunity. If you're here this morning and somebody invited you to come to church, a friend of yours that comes to this church, chances are they encourage you to come for this very reason. Would you maybe turn to that person and ask them, say, hey, would you go down there with me? Nothing wrong with that. 
Nothing wrong with that at all. It's a common occurrence around here. Maybe you invited somebody to come. Would you just turn to them and say to them, hey, would you like to go? I'll go with you. Folks, it's too important to leave undone. It really is. And I understand. Sometimes we're a little uncomfortable with the proposition. But I guarantee you, when you take that first step, when you take that first step, you'll be glad you did. Some have already come. They're getting help. Won't you come this morning? Don't let an opportunity like this pass. Don't let it slip. There's room at the cross for you. Maybe your past is not unlike our preacher here this morning. Maybe you've done some pretty bad things and you might be thinking, well, I don't know if God would be willing to save me. I've done so much. The truth is, the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. All sin. God says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they'll be like snow. Doesn't matter how far down the path of sin that you've gone, God can still save you. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, I haven't done a lot of those things. Do you know something? Calvary is a great equalizer. The worst sinner needs to do no more than trust Christ. But the best among us can afford to do no less. Friend, one sin will keep you out of heaven. It was one sin that sullied the human race and spread throughout. And God isn't going to let one sin into heaven. You've got to be perfectly cleansed and only Jesus Christ can do that. We'll sing a couple more verses. And just like life itself, this invitation will soon be over and the opportunity will be gone. Don't let it pass as we sing. As I said before, if somebody brought you here this morning, why don't you encourage them to come with you and come down the aisle as we sing. On the second. Though millions have found him a friend And have turned from the sins they have sinned The Savior still waits to open the gates And welcome the sinner before me There's room at the cross for you. The hand of my Savior is strong, and the love of my Savior is long. Through sunshine or rain, through loss or in blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still The Bible says that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. 
We've had four or five that have come already this morning. And uh, we're going to sing a couple more verses. Now, let me say this to you, and I'm not being facetious in the least bit. If you've got to get going, go. But I have a sense there's a couple more people here this morning, and you're still wrestling. You're still wrestling with it. And I tell you something, I don't want to get to heaven and have God say, how come you didn't extend that invitation a little longer? Oh, I was hungry. <laughs> you know? Uh, Brother Potbelly looked hungry, and I didn't want to. I'm not looking your way any particular reason, Brother Garcia. I'm not. I, I just happened to turn my head that way. I, I, don't you think that where we spend eternity is the most important thing in life? And uh, I, I would hate to cut someone's opportunity to trust Christ short because my stomach was growling a little bit. We're going to sing a couple more verses. Like I said, if you've got a pot roast burning in the oven, I don't want you to have burnt offering. <laughs> so if you've got to go, go. But I really believe from the bottom of my heart there's a couple more. I've been doing this for years. I just, I just have a sense there's a couple more of you here that are still kind of... Oh, let me encourage you to do it. Let me encourage you to do it. Others have already come. And I guarantee you they're going to be glad. They're going to walk out of here with a smile from ear to ear. Glad that they got that burden of sins off of their back and the knowledge that they know where they're going someday when they die. That's all this is about. Hey, folk, if you don't ever come back to this church again, I could care less. I want you to know Christ. And what he does with your life from there, that's between you and him. That's what this is all about, folks. We're going to sing two more verses. I want to sing the first and the last verse of that yes, song, sir. brother. Yes, sir. And again, maybe, maybe just coming forward, it's just kind of intimidating. I understand. I understand. There are a few scary people here. I, I, <laughs> but we'll protect you from them, okay? But uh, there is this opportunity. Yeah. And you don't want to pass it up. Right. As we right. sing, please. Please come. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. Its grace so free is sufficient for me, and deep is its fountain. As wide as the sea, there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Oh, millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we're dismissed, Father. We're certainly grateful, Lord, for the truth being presented to us this morning. And, uh, Father, it's not a pleasant truth, uh, Lord, the idea of eternal hell. But, Father, we realize you're a holy God. And, Lord, you have consequences for sin. Thank you, Lord, 
that you made a provision and a way out through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you this morning that a good, healthy handful of adult people are coming and availing themselves of that opportunity to trust Christ. Father, we pray that you'd open their hearts and minds to the truth of the Word of God and, Father, reveal Jesus Christ to them and help them to know that love and that forgiveness that comes only through him. Thank you, Lord, for what you did for us, most of us, years ago, some more recently, but, Father, it's still fresh in our hearts and minds. Lord, I believe here this morning that I'm one of those that had you not saved me, I wouldn't be on my way to hell now. I'd already be there. Lord, thank you for intervening in my life. And Lord, help us to go forth from this place, telling others how Jesus Christ can save. Lord, help us to tell them everywhere we go. And God, we just pray for those that are still wrestling, that are still struggling with the whole whole issue, Lord. And uh, God, we pray that as they leave this place, that you'd continue to work with them and have mercy and give them another chance. And God, we pray all of these things in Jesus Christ's matchless name. Amen.